to talk about custom uh, sports and high output applications and the importance of connecting the customer's engineering team with our uh, engineering team and really uh, some of the different things that set Wisconsin Lighting Lab apart from some of our, our larger competitors. Um, Jake, you had identified uh, a couple applications and, and orders uh, recently where um, you know we kind of took a more nuanced approach to the application, dialed in some custom brackets, and mechanical parts, uh, you know, custom accessories on the fixture, uh, custom controllers, you know, just things that you know really make uh, the lives of our contractors and their engineers easier. Um, you know, things that we can solve at the factory versus having to solve in the field. But when you look at one of the main differentiators of Wisconsin Lighting Lab in that category. Um, you know, what, what does that look like from an application perspective? Yeah, um, the biggest thing that we have as an advantage is design flexibility. Um, and really looking at an application as an entire application rather than just providing a lighting solution. And I know there's other manufacturers that have the ability to do that, but sometimes, um, especially when we're working on projects where we're just trying to cross a, another competitor and put in our products that is an equal um, there can be like some things that are lost in translation about the overall application and just like connecting dots on the actual project itself rather than just connecting dots on yeah. the product um, is really important and that's something that um, our applications team is doing better now of and it's 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 helping us win a lot of projects where we normally would probably not get a second look or even a first look necessarily at. Um, so, so it's, it's in essence kind of starting over with the requirements. Kind e of, even if yeah. there's a hundred page yeah. uh, sheet that was pieced together over the last five years. And it's always a combination of the, our competitors and the customer's engineers mm -hmm. where they arrive at these requirements. Right. It's not like, it's not like the engineer in charge of the project wrote all of those requirements. A lot of them come from, you know, engineering teams at very large uh, companies. Yeah. So we see it sometimes a little bit later in the game. And one approach would be, okay, go through, you know, all 100 pages line by line and decide if we have an equal or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what you're saying is what, what we've done is, okay, let's take a step back. What is the actual customer's requirement here? What's most important to them? And let's kind of start over a little bit. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, the customer, they don't necessarily care like what products there, they yeah. don't care about anything. They just care about reliability and having the, the right amount of light in the facility, yep. um, which sometimes they don't even really care about that. The reliability is probably the biggest, most important thing. Um, and it seems like with some of these projects, uh, just like, like you said, like peeling back the onion a little bit. And after we get, so like on a lot of, a lot of these capital projects, you have three bids, right? So you have three manufacturers bidding on a project. Generally, it's three. Um, there's obviously more than that. There's GCs involved and ECs involved. Yep. But generally, there's like three overall bids that are kind of included. And then they kind of bas they basically select whose ever bid is most attractive based on budget, based on um, a lot of variables. Uh, and one of the biggest variables that keeps happening is... Uh, the engineer, if we're connected directly to the engineer who's working on the bids, who's putting all the bids together for the end user, um, we have we have a lot more. If we have communication with that engineer, we can have a second look at the bids. Yep. We can um, dial down our design. We can figure out exactly what the what the engineer wants and what the end user ultimately wants. Um, and it just gives us, like I said before, it just gives us a lot more. Um, uh, ability to close these type of projects. Yeah. yeah, you look at the fundamentals of any application. Somebody has to design the customer's application. Somebody has to install the products. And somebody has to make the products. Yeah, so it's like closing the loop on all yeah, that and, stuff. And independent of the channel to market, you know, there's like 15 different ways that factories go to market in the lighting industry. Yeah. You know, there's direct channels, there's indirect channels. Um, you know, what we've always told our sales team and even our sales partners is independent of how this job goes to market, you know, get us in touch with the engineering team, get us in touch with the contractor. And it just gets rid of a lot of the, the telephone game. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that 
you know, a lot of factories don't necessarily, especially small and medium sized factories like us don't necessarily, uh, you know, invest in the team and the support infrastructure to be able to do that. Even if in theory, you know, it is best to do that. It's like, well, you have to have, you know, a small army of people that are, that are ready to support. So yeah, it's been, it's been great. And, you know, even some of the projects I've worked on is, you know, they come to us thinking that, okay, we're crossing a 50,000 lumen uh, fixture, Mm -hmm. you know, give us your closest equal. That's as simple as it is. And you look at it and it's like, well, who designed that bracket structure? Right. You know, who, you know, what, what's this, this custom finishing requirement? And you realize that 99% of the work and the challenge is actually in the mechanical parts, uh, you know, the, the, the poles, the brackets, not necessarily in the lights. Not that the lights are, are unimportant, but it's, it's really being able to shift focus on what solves the most pain points for the most people, you know, the contractor. Um, you know, we have done a lot of jobs recently where we will design the custom bracket structures that hold indoor fixtures, you know, from the ceiling. You know, we have, you know, we have a, a fabrication facility that can do, um, you know, custom, custom brackets. You know, we have, you know, plenty of folks that know SolidWorks, you know, plenty of people that connect with, you know, can connect with the engineers and help iron out those requirements. So, yeah, it seems- I, it's not even like, sorry to cut you off, no, but it's ahead. not even like to help them figure it out. It's to tell them a better solution than what. Yeah. Because a lot of times these engineers. That's a great point. And not like, not all, but most engineers that are working on these type of projects, they don't necessarily know as much about lighting as we do. We yeah. literally do it every single day. We live and breathe it. So it's a little bit different from our perspective than it is from their perspective because they're looking at the entire project as a whole generally like from an electrical standpoint um so one thing that we have a big advantage over uh over a lot of other manufacturers is again we have the fabrication background Uh, we're able to suggest things to pick up major efficiencies yep um in maybe labor for the for the gc um, maybe just manufacturing efficiencies for us Um, but these suggestions aren't things that can be found just by simply crossing products. Uh, again, it's looking at the whole application and just trying to figure out, hey, if we put six fixtures on this cross arm rather than individually mount all of these for this uplighting project, um, the labor is going to drop by 25% for yep. this EC estimate. That's a significant, significant drop. Um, and that those type of things help us help us to close those type of projects. It's like kind of it's not necessarily in our opinion, it's not thinking outside of the box, but to put the outside engineers, it is thinking outside of the yeah. box. And some of them are more receptive to that than others. Um, but if we spin it the proper way, we can get people on board much easier. Yep. So Trent, part of your uh, engineering skill set is uh, you know heavy um, mechanical and fabrication background and um, you know, kind of writing what, what what Jake had mentioned is it, it seems as though based on all of the infrastructure that has to be retrofitted, you know, you have 50 years of infrastructure that exists that has to be retrofitted. And then you also have, I think, buildings that are becoming more complex and you have standards that are, be, are becoming more strict. So not only are the buildings becoming more complex, but there's more standards to meet. I guess how from your some, from your view with a heavy mechanical background, you know how do you what are some of the things that you see in points of value and some of the challenges I guess for the customers engineers and um, and some of the opportunities for our team as the infrastructure gets retrofitted and as you know we can support people with these complicated building projects. Yeah, so I guess some of the major wins that we can give to a customer is making the install of our light fixtures as simple as possible. Um, We have pre-aimed mounts that may not necessarily be able to be utilized in their current setup. If they're doing a retrofit, maybe they have tenon tops and they use slip fitters. We can create an amount that is pre-aimed that they would actually just slip over the top of that, or it's possible we can just um you know design a cross arm where they can mount multiple fixtures on and they bolt the cross arm on and they bolt the pre aim fixture to the cross arm and it just makes the like jake was talking the install go that much faster and the lighting the end lighting is much better because it's exactly where we've designed it to be yeah and you know 
just making sure that we check all those boxes when we're talking to customers, like how are you mounting it and helping them with that. Also on the electrical side of things, having um, power distribution hubs so yep. that wiring is easy um, and that all goes quickly for them on the install. And also on the electrical and electronic side is we have uh, we have various control options too. We have a mesh control option which we use. We have um, you know DMX options. We have wired. You know we have wireless. And you know we can also we try and commission those things at the factory. Mm -hmm. So how many you know we we ID all of the nodes. You know we program all of the different scenes. You know certainly there's there's support and commissioning that's needed, but it's it's to you know, not over solve things. You know, we still want contractors and we still want our local partners to to have a hand in um, solving challenges on the front end and the inevitable challenges, you know, after the, the, the project's installed. But you know, I think like what Jake was saying before is we we take a holistic view. You know, a, a high output lighting application, you have the application design, you have the mechanical you know the, the the fixture design, the bracket design. You have the power system. You know we have applications where we put remote power cabinets in in panel rooms at the you know the base of the pole. But not every customer wants that. Mm -hmm. You know so there's others. You know other competitors in our industry that you know, forces customers to do that every single time when they may maybe don't want to. There's other competitors that never do it. So it's it's trying to have options without o having too many you know options. I think. Um, but it's also, you know, we at, at a minimum, we understand the different requirements and we are a, a kind of a one stop shop for the lighting, the application, the pull bracket structures, the remote power, um, you know, the, the, the control systems. Um, so I, I think that is, you know, those nuances are, are important, but they're only helpful if you can also support them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other side is, you know, the application, the engineering uh, support on every project other thoughts yeah i guess just thinking of a, a recent job we had to install and up lighting we had um the customer had showed us a design for utilizing threaded rod going down below the fixture and then they had a very heavy um, steel channel underneath the fixture and then they bolted our standard harp to it and it was just really heavy or over complicated and we were able to supply like a custom side plate that the threaded rod bolted directly to, and it was much more cost effective and easier for them to install. So, and that's something we designed in a matter of hours, and yeah. we had prototypes quickly, and we had uh, you know production parts within within a couple yeah. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So less, yeah. And that's where again, it's you know okay, we're a lighting business, but so much of that lighting business is the mechanical part side because that's where the rubber meets the road. It's like a it's like a car. You can have the highest horsepower car in the world, but if your tires aren't very good, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You can have the brightest light in the world, but if it doesn't bolt into the application properly, you know, it, it doesn't you know it doesn't matter. So um, you know Jake, as far as the the application funnel, you know, it it goes from customer engineer to our application uh, engineering team um, and then to our, our product engineering team, you know, how do you look at different checkpoints in the process without slowing the process down? So I think that's also, um, that's also one of the, it's, it's like a bit of an art form mm -hmm. because we're always asked to react very, very quickly. And then, um, you know, if the final construction drawings or if the final application uh, differs from the initial design, you know, in some cases, you know, that can create challenges in the back end. So we, we, we are in some cases getting drawings that are several years old mm -hmm. and we never get the updated ones. How do you kind of balance that engineer to engineer to engineer funnel and keep things moving without, um, you know, looking over the important details? Yeah. The most important thing is just to identify when projects, when something seems a little off on a project, maybe like you said, the drawings, provided were really old but for some reason like you could just google the name of the project and there's 50 articles about it and yep. they're recent articles and some nice it's, renderings right yeah and it's yeah. like okay well if if this yeah if this local news place can get these renderings <laughs> like we should be able to get to the engineer that's a great point and yeah. uh get some better drawings on this yeah and generally the engineer 
is, and this is where we're trying to connect dots and get closer to the specifying engineers on the front end, because usually we're somewhat removed and yeah. usually we're working through channels um, or directly with maybe an end user or a contractor who has been given these drawings by an engineer. And they're basically tasked with just trying to determine what the engineer has on this drawing and how to get materials to achieve what the, what the drawing shows. So that's one thing where we can backtrace and it's like, we go back to our channels, whoever we're talking with, wherever we're working with, um, we say, Hey, we have, this is our solution for what your question is. Basically, this is our one-to-one -one option. If you guys, this will answer that part of the question first. Um, and then as a side note, like we list what we think can change or what we think can be better or what we require, um, to kind of close what we think would re be required to close the project in like a proper way, rather than just crossing things one-to-one. -one. Um, yeah, I'm going to still give you our one-to-one -one option just because that's what you asked for. Um, unless it's like a completely out in left field type of project. Uh, but this, we're going to also list other things that we, we think we need to do to close it. And generally what we think we need to do is we need to get some type of contact directly with the engineer um, and ask them questions. Ask them, is there an updated drawing? Ask them, what are the actual lighting requirements rather than just crossing the fixtures they had already selected? Maybe ask them why they selected the original fixtures. Just like things like that um, kind of helps us close the loop altogether. Um, and that's one thing that we just, we, we really want to do a better job of is connecting application engineering to, en to outside engineering, application engineering kind of connects to Trent's team, the yep. internal production engineering team, um, and finding these solutions. And I think that's, that's like the channel where we have the best luck. Sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's uh, just knowing that everybody uh, plays a role yeah. and not competing against, um, you know, the other, other people's positions in the, in the project. Like it could be, you know, it well worth somebody's time to spend, uh, you know, a morning getting a contact at an engineering firm to, yeah. you know, get us the right, you know, kind of communication channel on a project. Um, it's just, you know, there's really a divide and conquer approach to a lot of these jobs. And it really comes down to, you know, the right people getting in touch with the, you know, with, with the right people. Um, Trent, one example of this uh, from a few years back was the Alaska Airlines project. So what was the solution we ended up providing there? I think that touches, we didn't do controls on that job, although I think the fixtures were controls ready and they never yep. ended up purchasing them. But that that touched on the lighting, uh, the mechanical, the retrofit, uh, controls ready. Just go through that solution. Yeah, so at the Alaska Airlines Center, we had um, the first challenge, I guess, was remote mounting the drivers. They had catwalk structures up above the arena floor and they wanted the drivers easily accessible in the event of a failure. So, which there never has been, right? It's been so, been, been I don't a few know, years, five, four or five <laughs> years, um, no issues yet, and don't anticipate any. <laughs> and we also wanted to provide uh, remote um, drivers, but also quick connect electrical, um, so that they didn't have to run wiring, yep. and it goes straight from the driver to the light fixture. They also had, uh, I believe, uh, we had to do slit fitter mounts on that project. Mm -hmm. So that was something unique that we did. And also they wanted all black fixtures to match the black uh, railings on the catwalk. And we did all anodized black on the fixture side of the project. And the remote driver cabinets we provided um, also were black, textured, powder-coated black. And we, like you mentioned, had... Uh, a location for them to hook up controls if they ever wanted to, yep. but they just never ended up needing that. And they still can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the custom side on the, on the control side, we've been seeing uh, Dolly coming up more for some of the uh, interior sports applications. We've got one job, I think going in Michigan right now that mm -hmm. um, we have to provide a, a Dolly um, controller to communicate with their, is it a building management system? Yeah. That's, okay. Yeah. That's so how do you, saying. what do you see Jake within sports, um, from a control standpoint, you know, uh, the off the shelf, um, 
I should say the integrated control systems for the particular fixture manufacturer versus things like DMX and Dolly, where the fixture has to communicate with an on-site control system. Where do you see some of the customization requests coming in to the applications team? Um, so yeah, the the controls is kind of separated into two two main things. Like you have um, you have proprietary controls like what we would provide. Um, from the factory and then you have just like the on-site controls Um, and it's kind of it's the like the split is generally um, most like interior jobs have on-site controls especially when it's like a higher end facility Um, and and those are usually going to be dmx or dolly yeah those are usually dmx or dolly okay yeah um i i i don't even think there isn't there I don't. I think those are literally the only two okay. that it, that it, that it would be and that those, I've seen. At are least. those usually wired or wireless? Uh, it's usually wired. Wired. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then with our proprietary outside, um, with our proprietary um, uh, controls, we're primarily looking at projects that are outside, um, exterior projects where it's just like a uh, local ball field or something like that, where they just want to have local control. Um, now, there are always some cases where you have like parks and recs develop, uh, departments where they want to be able to access uh, controls off site, which we can do um, technically with our with our extern- with our wireless system. Um, but that would be the only time where things need to be kind of like integrated with other lighting projects around like a like a city, for example. Yeah. Um, the interior stuff is is relatively easy because generally they have controls engineers on site True. that deal with a lot of that stuff we talk directly with the controls engineers they tell us exactly what they want yep. um, whether they want terminal blocks like in this example they just basically wanted um, dolly compatible uh, drivers fixtures um, and then they just wanted a place where they can wire easily wire into that what, system. Fu- what functions were they looking for ultimately for the fixtures was it emergency and dimming and zone control yeah those are the main three okay. um, on off i guess too you yep. could kind of throw that in with dimming um, but the for sure were emergency, and then um, yeah, just on off is, okay. is the are the main two that they wanted. Um, there isn't on this specific job. There isn't like any RGB or anything like that that they would deal with. And RGB was probably a little bit separate from Dolly, um, as far as I know. That's that's RGB has to be done on like a DMX style of a system. Typically, yeah. yeah. So it's like, I, if they wanted if they wanted RGB, um, the solution would maybe be a combination of like Dolly compatible stuff as well as like the DMX system specifically for the RGB fixtures, um, something like that. So how could you do that, Trent? Mm-hmm. I don't think we we've, we've talked about it. I don't know if it's yeah. And I guess you you could do across Dolly and DMX. I mean, all the white would be controlled yeah, by Dolly, yeah. and then the RGB would you'd have run to have dedicated DMX. yeah dedicated RGB stuff in that in that example. Yeah. yeah. So you, in, in that example, you'd have to dim the white independently of RGB before like engaging the DMX controls, right? Otherwise, yeah. the white's going to wash out yeah. all the yeah, yeah, all yeah. the RGB for sure. Yeah. Well, cool. So I guess last thing um, on the RGB topic, and I guess we'll maybe amber and PC amber and all of that. There, there's more and more of that that we're seeing requests for in the high output space. You know, it's not just pick your color temperature it's now you know what color temperature do you want rgb do you want a mix of white and rgb Um, we're also doing amber we're doing pc amber Um, we're designing a system right now it's probably one of the largest amber light towers in the world for a military uh, application Um, that's a high output product so that's you know that's pretty cool from a, a board and a color temp and a color standpoint, Trent, what are some of the different product options that we offer for sports and infrastructure applications? Yeah, I guess um, for sports applications, we have our RGB board, um, which would mostly be used indoor. We do have a couple of uh, outdoor options, and then obviously the white in various color temperatures from like 2200K up to 6500K we can accomplish yep. in white. Um, amber we can also do uh, true amber and then phosphor converted amber and we also do um, custom single color options Um, we actually dual purpose our amber board but we populate them with like a only blue leds or only green leds or red leds if they want to do like accent lighting on a building or a bridge and 
they don't have any need to change color. Mm-hmm. It'll give them the most lumen output versus having like the RGB board being used. Yep. Yeah, I was talking to uh, talking to Tyler a little bit yesterday, and um, he mentioned that uh, right now we have hundreds of fixtures on the production schedule that are either controls or and or RGB. So it's just when you look at um, those are becoming more uh, you know more and more popular. And one of the cool things with our uh, our GFX control system is that can control both RGB and white or a combination of the two. Mm-hmm. So especially for outdoor uh, applications, parks and recs depart- departments, smaller colleges, um, you know, high school fields, uh, you know, customers where in for the other solutions, they might be, you know, cost prohibitive to actually get all of those different combinations. Um, you know, we see it, it's only about a few percent adder on a project to go from, you know, poles, brackets, fixtures, you know, plus your remote power to integrating some of these different control options. So I think it's a really good uh, solution uh, for customers, and it really allows them to get the most out of their investment. Like they're already spending two hundred thousand dollars on a sports complex. You know, spending an extra five percent to get color changing. You know, to get controls. Um, you know, can really be a nice way to enhance the. You know, really enhance the community. Yeah, and that's another. It just all comes back to that's another reason why talking to the engineers on these projects is really important because oftentimes they don't necessarily know exactly what the cost of things are um, and they're just specifying what products they think is 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 necessary Um, so they might over specify they might under specify and if we can kind of close those loops um, get directly to those guys really talk them through our products um, because most of the products we're talking about are relatively new in the last couple of years. So there's, a, there's many engineering firms that have, don't have experience with our products and just kind of educating them on what the capabilities are um, and what the flexibilities are is, is really important right now. No, I am. Uh, yeah. It's, um, and we're here, you know, we're here to, here yeah. to support, pick up the phone, call your either local sales agency that we sell through or, you know, call, um, you know, call us, you know, direct and we can, you know, always support you and then route you through the, the proper buying channel. Um, and I guess maybe the, the thing to thing to end on would be how even when we customize things, we are not starting from scratch with the solution. Mm-hmm. Like we're, you know, we try and not, um, you know, reinvent the wheel for mission critical components like our, our driver architecture, you know, the thermal management, um, you know, a lot of these things are proven. And, you know, I guess, Trent, talk about, you know, if we swap in an RGB board for a, uh, you know, put art, use RGB instead of white, it's not like that fixture is being completely redesigned. It's a proven yeah. platform. It's, it's, it's a flexible platform. For sure. We take a very modular approach to our fixture design. So when we're designing RGB boards, we want it to bolt up to the same hole pattern as our white um, LEDs and we have the same heat sinks use the same chassis we're just changing the electrical components so even the optics are all the same yep. while they react differently to different light sources it's still the same products we just yep. make sure that we use them appropriately so we get the right color mixing happening and um, everything is literally swap in swap out yep. so that's what makes it so cost effective for the customer they don't have to buy a rgb specific fixture it's got rgb integrated into it yep and we can just take the white module out put the rgb in and add uh, three drivers and yeah it's kind of like a it's almost like a gaming pc versus like a you know an apple laptop yep. like a gaming pc you can swap in different different memory cards and you can use you know different components and it's expandable and it's because we live in the project business custom applications world and um you know we we embrace that we're other factories that are you know trying to make widgets and you know here's uh here's a price you know go sell them like that's that's just not our not our model so well cool thanks a lot guys that was a a great discussion and thanks for all you do it will yeah Yeah, thank you